Section 35, The Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Esmond, Castleton on Hudson, New York. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill. Section 35, The Eucharist. Article 3, Transubstantiation. Anglican Position. Transubstantiation cannot be proved by Holy Writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture, overthrowing the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. 39 Articles of the English Church. Article 28. Catholic Doctrine. According to Catholic teaching, not only are the body and the blood of Christ really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist, but the whole substance of the bread is changed into the substance of the body of Christ, and the whole substance of wine into his blood. After the words of consecration are uttered, nothing of the bread or of the wine remains, but the accidents or appearances. The accidents are the color, shape, taste, hardness, fluidity, and other qualities perceptible by the senses. By the divine power these are preserved without the substance of bread or of wine. This complete and utter conversion of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is called transubstantiation. The doctrine of transubstantiation is an article of faith. It is denied by the Reformed churches, most of which reject any real or substantial presence of the body or the blood of Christ in the Eucharist. The Lutherans, who believe in a real presence, but only at the moment of communion, hold nevertheless that the bread and wine remain after the consecration and are received together with the body and blood of Christ. According to the Lutheran conception, then, there is no conversion of one substance into another, whereas such conversion is the essence of the Catholic idea of transubstantiation. In the present article we assume, as already proved, the Catholic doctrine of the real presence. The question now under discussion is, how do the body and blood of the Lord come to be present? Our answer is, by transubstantiation, or by the changing of the bread and wine into the body and blood, nothing of the bread and wine remaining but the accidents. Transubstantiation is immediately deducible from the words used by our Lord when he instituted the Eucharist. Jesus took bread, and blessed, and broke, and gave to his disciples, and said, Take ye, and eat. This is my body. Matthew, chapter 26, verse 6. From these words, two inferences are clearly established. One, what was once bread is now the body of Christ. Two, therefore, the Lord must have changed the bread into his body. And this is transubstantiation. The first of these inferences cannot easily be denied. For when the Lord said, This is my body, what he held in his hands was really and truly his body. And yet it was precisely what had been described in the same sentence of the evangelist as bread. Therefore, what was once bread is now the body of the Lord. The second inference is easily deducible from the first, for if a thing is now A and afterward B, it must have undergone a change or conversion from A into B. It may be objected to this argument that although it may, at first sight, seem perfectly logical, it does not take into account the possibility of a figurative use of language in the case under consideration. A man might hand another a purse filled with money and say, This is money. Although in reality, two things were present, the purse and the money. And just so, when our Lord said those words, This is my body, his body may have been really present, but the bread may have been present also. The objection has a specious appearance, but it is hardly more than specious. The use of such a figure of speech is neither customary nor rational except when one of the two things has a necessary and intimate relation with the other, such as certainly does not obtain in the case of bread and a human body. 
but such a relation does exist between a purse and the money it contains. The purse was made to contain money, and, as the money is what the giver is almost exclusively thinking of, he would deem it trivial to mention the purse unless it happened to have a very exceptional value. But bread has no such relation to a human body. In the second place, the apostles would have been deceived if anything had been present but the body of Christ. First, because the strict, and at the same time the most obvious meaning of the words required the exclusion of bread. Second, they knew he had it in his power to convert bread into his body. They had seen him convert water into wine, and that, too, without leaving a drop of water in the excellent wine he had made. Why not a similar conversion of substance into substance at the Last Supper? Indeed, our Lord would seem to have wished, by the miracle at the marriage feast, to prepare his apostles for a miracle of the same order at the Last Supper. Under these circumstances, was it not the natural thing for the apostles to receive the words, This is my body, in a purely literal sense? This, that is, all of this, is my body and why receive together with his precious body, which at that moment was receiving the incense of angels, common bread, infinitely inferior in value to that which accompanied it, affording no nourishment to their souls, and serving no purpose such as is served by the accidents which veil the face of the Lord from human gaze. The Anglicans have a way of answering this last question, which we shall consider later. Third, the apostles were witnessing at the Last Supper the founding of a great Christian rite, which they were did perpetuate in the Church of God, and in the institution of which words would naturally be taken in their strict and literal sense, no room being left for personal interpretation, such as the words of institution have been subjected to these past few centuries. Had the apostles thought of the matter at all, they would doubtless have deemed it perilous to interpret the words uttered on that memorable night in such wise as to admit of the presence of anything but the sacred body of their Lord, which was delivered for them. The words, This is my body, are therefore to be taken as meaning that the bread was simply and without any distinction converted into the body of Christ, and that nothing remained of the bread but the appearances. Our separated brethren should be the last persons in the world to go back on the plain words of Scripture, and yet the Anglicans, whilst doing so quite notably in the case of the Blessed Sacrament, charge Catholics with doing the same thing. Repugnant to the plain words of Scripture is the indictment leveled at us by the 28th article. Which plain words of Scripture are alluded to? This is my body, which shall be delivered for you, or these? This is my blood, which shall be shed for many. Perhaps they are these, for as often as you shall eat this bread, etc., which St. Paul used in writing to the Corinthians. If so, we Catholics use the selfsame words unblushingly. Even in the sacrifice of the Mass, and after the consecration, as for instance when we say, The holy bread of life eternal, or the heavenly bread will I receive, and on the Lord's name will call. But we understand one another, as St. Paul and his neophytes understood one another. We know how to discern in this bread only the body of the Lord. The direct argument from Holy Writ receives remarkable confirmation from the writings of the fathers of the early church, who commented on the scriptural texts forming the basis of our demonstration. When the fathers are unanimous, or nearly so, on any point of doctrine, their opinion has always been regarded as the common teaching of the Church. Here, as in the case of the real presence, there is no dearth of testimonies from the fathers. Indeed, so abundant are they that, whatever may be said of the few passages sometimes cited against the Catholic doctrine, no impartial student of the ancient writings can escape the conclusion that there is a consensus of the fathers on the subject of transubstantiation. Not only do they tell us that after the consecration what was common food is now the body and blood of Christ, St. Justin Martyr and St. Augustine, that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, 
St. Athanasius, that he took bread and made it his body, Tertullian, but many of them, as St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. John Chrysostom, St. Cyril of Alexandria, St. John Damascene, St. Ambrose, make use of terms which are, in the strictest sense, equivalents of transubstantiation. Moreover, they illustrate the change of substance by comparing it to the changing of water into wine, the changing of the rod of Moses into a serpent, and the like. The testimony of the fathers is borne out by that of the ancient liturgies cited in the preceding article in favor of the real presence. There can be no doubt, then, about the meaning of our Lord's words as interpreted by the fathers of the ancient church. But, overwhelming as the testimony of antiquity is in favor of the Catholic dogma, our Protestant opponents are not easily driven from the field. They have brought a searchlight to bear on the writings of the fathers, and they have succeeded in finding a few passages in which the writers do actually say and express terms that the substance or nature of the bread remains after the consecration of the host. And these passages are forthwith used as a key for the unlocking of the meaning of all other passages bearing on the same subject. But what a difficult task it must be to use the key thus furnished on any of the numerous passages alluded to above in which transubstantiation is so strongly emphasized by the use of terms that once so varied and yet so identical in meaning, and by the use of so many and such luminous comparisons. Writers like Bingham and Pearson should have been led to suspect that unless the fathers differed from one another, or even contradicted themselves on so important a subject, in this they cannot admit, the true meaning of the terms substance and nature may not have been grasped by the Protestant student, and indeed could not be grasped by any student who was not well acquainted with the linguistic usage of the times. And that the meaning has been mistaken has been demonstrated by the illustrious Franzelin in his treatise on the Eucharist. He shows that at a time when there was little fixity or uniformity in the theologian's use of philosophical terms, both Greek and the Latin words for substance and nature, were occasionally used to designate the sensible qualities of things, form, color, taste, etc., and these are precisely what are understood by the Eucharistic accidents, which remain after the substance of bread and wine have disappeared. These accidents are a reality. They are not deceptive phantasms. They are the sensible qualities miraculously preserved after the substance has departed. The fathers quoted knew well the distinction between substance and accident, but they occasionally availed themselves of a customary looseness of terminology to express an idea which exact philosophy would have expressed otherwise. The fact of such looseness of language is established by Franzelin by quoting from St. Gregory of Nyssa, Athanasius, St. John Chrysostom, and Tertullian. He shows, moreover, that some of the fathers who in the clearest terms declare their belief in transubstantiation have, in other parts of their works, by confining their attention to the reality of the outward sign of the sacrament, seem to be speaking of another possible reality, the substance of the bread, which, however, was absent. He afterward remarks that the fathers in question not only can, but must be understood as speaking only of the sensible species, and not of the substance in the true philosophical meaning of the term, for otherwise they would be contradicting the common teaching with which they cannot have disagreed. And besides, in the context of the passages quoted, they say, on the one hand, that the bread is changed into the body of Christ, and that, consequently, not two bodies remain, namely the bread and the body of Christ, but only the body of Christ, and on the other, that the nature of bread remains, which would be a plain contradiction if the expression, the nature of bread, were not understood, as he explains it. Some pertinent remarks of Leibniz, the distinguished philosopher and theologian of the 17th century, will add not a little to the force of the Catholic argument. 
Oftentimes, he says, as the body and blood of Christ are not distinguishable by the senses, the name of the bread and wine is applied to the remaining species. Thus, St. Ambrose declares the word of the Lord to be so efficacious, are what they were, and are changed into another thing. That is, the accidents are what they were, the substance is changed. For the same father says that after the consecration, they are not to be believed anything else but the body and blood of Christ. And the Roman pontiff Gelasius insinuates that the bread is changed into the body while the nature of the bread remains. That is to say, its qualities or accidents, for in those times the forms of speech were not measured in strict accordance with metaphysical notions. And it was in this sense also that Theodoret said that in this conversion, which he himself calls a change, the mystic symbols are not divested of their proper nature. These expressions may be worthy of notice, as bearing against those writers of the present day, who hold that even the accidents of the bread do not really remain, but only the appearances of them, or an empty and dreamlike apparition. In a certain epistle to Caesarius, attributed to St. John Chrysostom, a document which threw Protestants into an ecstasy when first brought to light, the writer speaks of the nature of bread as remaining, but immediately afterward he adds, and there are not two bodies, but rather one, that of the Son, of God, which would certainly not be true if bread were present. In another passage, which is a favorite with Protestant controversialists, writer Theodoret explains that although the nature of the elements has not changed, the eye of the understanding sees what they have been made, and belief and adoration follow. He evidently means that the nature of the elements is unchanged only as regards the sensible appearances. And now, as to the second accusation of the 28th article, viz., that transubstantiation overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, a few words will suffice. Catholics and Protestants agree in this, that in every sacrament there must be an outward part, an outward sign, which by its nature is fitted to be a symbol of the interior grace bestowed. Now one of the stock arguments of the English reformers against transubstantiation was that the outward part of the sacrament of the Eucharist must be nutritive bread. Otherwise, it could not signify the spiritual nutrition given to the soul. And therefore, as transubstantiation destroyed the bread, it destroyed the sacrament. But why, we ask, insist on the presence of nutritive bread? Will not the accidents of bread, which are an outward sign of the most impressive kind, suffice as a symbol of interior nourishment? But you will say, there is no reality about them. Ah, but there is. They are the real accidental qualities of what once was bread. They seem so real to Locke, whose philosophy has so profoundly influenced English thought, that they were called by him the nominal substance, of which we have some knowledge, as distinguished from the real substance, of which we have no knowledge. As to the superstition which transubstantiation is charged with occasioning, we shall have a word to say in the last article on the Eucharist. See the Eucharist, its congruities, and superstitions. End of section 35, The Eucharist. Recording by Paul Esmond, Castleton-on-Hudson, New York.